Everything in this world has a cost, especially enlightenment. Before we have this review of chapter 47 of Record of Ragnarok, please do me a favor and leave your own thoughts on the chapter in the comment section down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, make sure you hit that little notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Now, let's get into it. What's up guys, I got the pencil here, and here we are to review chapter 47 of Record of Ragnarok, known as The Path. And I'm assuming The Path to Enlightenment. So let's hop right on into it. So the chapter opens with a continuation right off of last chapter. And we get to see that Buddha is a menace, like an absolute menace. Oh wait, actually before we hop into the chapter itself, I actually really do like Buddha's coloration. I think it's very, very cool. I don't know, it's quite... Once again, Buddha has a very simple on the basis. Simply put, he is, once again, another fantastic example of Record of Ragnarok design, where on the surface it seems rather simple, but as you go into more details upon details from all the different variations of his clothing to all the different colors and symbols on him, he is a very interesting character just to look at. And colored, he, they did a very good job with him. When I'm talking about that, let's actually hop into the chapter itself, because we do have a decent amount to talk about. So, we hop into the chapter, and we get to see that Big Papa Buddha is just styling on Zero, stopping the attack from Zero dead in his tracks with one simple shield. And it was really that easy, and as Brunhild goes to explain, his weapon is sort of like a mood ring? Like, it changes into multiple different variations of the six paths that people can be reincarnated into, just based on his emotions and like he has no real idea how to control it like interesting but i don't know that was a weird thing i thought he literally summoned out a different version of it but maybe he didn't last chapter that was just it responding to his emotional state i guess that's weird i don't know I, it's kind of cool that both of their weapons rely on their emotions though which makes sense as the chapter goes on to later explain there's a lot of interesting stuff in this chapter i'm not gonna lie but speaking of shape-shifting weapons, we see that, once again, the Misery Cleaver goes onto a completely different form. Like, it went from just multiple big ol' axes into, like, multiple tiny needles. He plans to shred Buddha to bits, but this attack, not necessarily this attack, but this weapon seems very much smaller range. Like, it actually fits a bit more to Zero's proportions, especially compared to the massive thing he just slapped Buddha with. So, I sort of get what he was going for, but at the same time, I guess... But really, you saw how well Buddha was dodging you close range before. So why would you shrink your range instead of trying to over... I mean, I guess because Buddha literally did just push that gigantic weapon off. So you're probably going for efficiency over just sheer size. But I don't know. I feel like this wasn't the best idea. But then, of course, his staff changes again. And Buddha has this interesting mace, or as it's called, Six Realm Staff, Second Realm, Animal Realm, Horse Face Cannon. Very interesting. I actually really like the design of this thing, especially with like the little extra detail of it seeming to be like fused together down the middle. Like you can see the lines that connect it. I like that. It's very, very cool. And we get to see that Buddha is like, okay, so I know this is like the Kingdom Hearts fan in me, which is going dumb, but like his weapon kind of reminds me of the Keyblade. Like it just forms and it also responds very well to its user's emotions. It seems to have its own will. Like, I don't know. That's kind of neat. I really do like that because he literally talks with it. He's like, oh, it's you. Like, he's actually had conversations with these weapons before. And I don't know, that's kind of cool to me. That's what I loved about Kingdom Hearts, and I kind of wish that aspect was more focused on. Because after a while, the Keyblade sort of just became a weapon. So I'm glad that Buddha has some sort of, like, interpersonal relationship with his weapon, rather than Zero, who just seems to be wielding his weapon. But it does also seem to be extension of his body. Like, he yanked the Misery Cleaver out of himself, and it is responding to his every command. So essentially, the Misery Cleaver may just be, like, an extra muscle to Zero, which is very cool. And I like how he wields it. But the thing is... I don't know what Zero's plan was, because he knows Buddha can still see into the future. So, I guess maybe he was hoping his range, slash all the sharp blades on it, would, like, work out. But, I don't know. It just doesn't seem... I don't know what he was really going for here. I guess you just have to keep attacking, because if you don't attack, then the match is just going to go on forever. But, man, like, when Buddha ducks it and manages to attack him, I don't know what Zero really expected. <laughs> like, he's so shocked and confused, and, man, Ares, you are so fodder, bro, like... Just remove yourself from the series. Just, man, I will hop into the manga myself and erase you if need be. I don't even need a Valkyrie weapon. Just come here and catch this. But regardless of that, we get to see that Zero, he gets cut. There was the counter, and Hermes casually explains that he got in, Buddha got in range to counterattack as Zero attack because he basically did leave himself massively open 
because if he missed the overhead of the attack, like he obviously wasn't going to cut himself. So I just left his whole side exposed. And that's exactly what Buddha did. Took his weapon and just slice zero real quick. And you can tell that Buddha is technically holding back because if he could slice zero like that, he definitely could have done way more damage than that little cut to his abdomen. So we, it's starting to build into what the chapter is talking about and what I think I'm going to enjoy about this fight in the long run, especially in retrospect. But we get to see that Buddha is known as history's strongest adolescent. <laughs> I'm so like, I'm like extremely torn on that title because I especially get it now, especially now understanding what this battle is really between, not just like the variations of fulfillment which is given to you and fulfillment which you earn. Like I'm starting to get it already, but I don't know, like Buddha, this being that's held in such high regard being the history's strongest adolescent it just it just blows my mind but once again this is record of ragnarok it's wild so i'm happy to see it and of course we get to see that buddha is sort of trapped in this adolescent state because we get to see him young and honestly buddha young just throws me off i'm not gonna lie i think it's the glasses and i know that sounds wild to say but always even in real life whenever i see someone without their glasses it just throws me off but seeing him like this especially in like the more traditional clothing it just feels weird it feels off it feels unnatural but i guess that's supposed to be the point like this is buddha human even though the interesting thing that gets me about this whole flashback part is that buddha always had like the extended lower fangs i don't know that always throws me off but it makes sense because as i explained he's supposedly a child of destiny like he was meant to be the ruler who is going to lead his kingdom into true prosperity and thus be the perfect ruler of the entire world and I guess so, because my man was born with teeth, and like, babies usually don't have, do babies have teeth fresh out? I don't think they do, I'm pretty sure you have to wait a while for those things to pop in, but no, Buddha came out with just a little lower fangs, but that's really interesting to me, I wonder how much this divine intervention was, and I wonder who it was in particular. Because in Buddha's backstory, there's a lot of reference to deities, and I don't know that much about Buddhism, I don't know how much record of ragnarok's authors are taking specifically from buddhism but i'm pretty sure hinduism is the main religion that predates buddhism and is what buddhism sort of spawned off of like the original buddha was born into the world of hinduism and supposedly it was the gods who gave him this blessing and i'm assuming the easy path to enlightenment as you can see by the sharpened fangs early on in life and stuff like that like he seems to be predestined and that's a big thing that's noted so i'm wondering which hindu god it was because honestly buddha reminds me a lot of shiva they're both young men who enjoy a good fight and happen to have destroyed the foundations of their old world and just so happen to kind of look similar but also have a united focus on like free will individuality living your dreams doing whatever you want in particular like they aren't necessarily bound to their ancient ways and i feel like It'd be kind of ironic if Shiva is the person who raised up the next winner for humanity because of the predestiny. And we know technically Shiva was king for a while or leader of the Hindu gods for a long while. So we have no idea when that was relative to Buddha's backstory. But it'd be cool if Shiva was the one who like sort of nudged Buddha along in terms of becoming who he was. And that would be cool i don't know i would enjoy that but i don't think that may be the case i don't think this is ever gonna be mentioned again if it is mentioned and we get to meet that i would love to see that because i'd love to see buddha's reaction to knowing that one of the gods he may have just watched fight or one of the gods in that very stadium is what gave him this life that he lived like i don't know seems like a super interesting thing especially considering how much buddha hates the deities well as later on explained in the chapter he hates anyone who gets in his way but thing is he, he does have a solid hate for the deity. So I'm super intrigued to see what his reaction would be if he found out who blessed him in this way and led to his current life. And the great thing that I love about this backstory the most is that I can definitely see Zero in Buddha's older sibling, quote unquote. Like his brother, Jotanka, did so much work for his people that he ended up running himself ragged. And maybe not, maybe the illness was something that completely separate of that, but he was so focused on other people's happiness that he never got to experience any happiness for himself. Just like Zero was so focused on helping other people attain happiness in his own forced way, rather than worrying about himself, and that led to his despair. So I can definitely see Buddha looking at Zero almost like a brother he can actually save, like looking at him like a Jataka that he could have saved from illness, because Buddha, no matter how powerful he became, no matter how enlightened he became, all he could do was take his older brother's dead body from that place full of lies where they all said he would be happy and proud of all the things that he did, even though Buddha knows he wasn't. It's impressive to see how 
sad, but how well this is going to tie into the present. Because now, looking at the fight, I can definitely see Buddha taking a more passive edge to Zero, trying to bring him into a more positive light, a world where he can fully understand the blessings of it on his own, on top of the ability to allow people to achieve their own path of destiny, not relying on the help or the will of the gods. I love that. It's just a very interesting story, and I love the parallels between Buddha's older brother and Zero, and on top of that, I also happen to enjoy the parallels between the multiple realms that I mentioned. Like the animal realm, we get to see Buddha experience. We get to see Buddha experience a lot of the realms, the human realm, all the different levels, and all of those combined with the realm of death, I'm assuming, which would be the passing of his elder brother. That is what allows him to truly achieve enlightenment. And it honestly makes me wonder once again, like, what divine intervention was there like was there any or was this something that buddha truly achieved on his own and he just truly awoke to enlightenment in a moment's notice like it simply happened and suddenly bam he just achieved enlightenment because i don't know I, once again i don't know that much about buddha but i don't think the story went this way i think he was sitting under a tree don't don't feel free to correct me if i'm wrong i'm pretty sure he hid enlightenment after like 49 days under a specific tree and I think he was starving himself. But ironically enough, Buddha in this backstory actually goes against the idea of starving yourself. He goes against the ideas of anything traditional, and he lives by his own whims. And it's very interesting to see another thing, the shift from Buddha like the nice, caring prince to the Buddha that we know today. Like, this enlightenment seemed to shatter Buddha and, like, reforge him into something else, something similar to what he was, someone who wanted to be free. But it's like the cage that was holding back Buddha, the cage of the life of Siddhartha, that is what finally snapped, and he allows himself to be fully free. Like, he realizes it. He throws his head back and laughs after having this realization, points his fingers to the sky, and says, I've got it. Enlightenment. It's a very interesting moment. I like how it was almost... I mean, it was intense. It was a moment that was built up to. Like, you can see how he flashes back through all the different moments. Like, in the wheel that you get to see, you get to see his hypothetical life. You get to see all those things. You get to see the life of man. You see, you get to see all the different realms. You see Buddha processing all of it. And then his eyes just awaken to this new level. They showed the eyes that he has now. And it shows that. I don't know. It's a very interesting process. I like the way Record of Ragnarok did it, even if it does feel a bit speedy. But once again, this is... A series where things have to go fast. We have so many more fights to get through. We're only on fight number six. So obviously I understand that things have to go fast. And I think this almost works because it feeds once again to the question of the divine intervention. It makes you wonder what Buddha was. Like, was Buddha a mistake? Like, was this not supposed to happen? I'm assuming it wasn't because every other human in the world and of course all the other gods are like, they don't like Buddha. I feel like he was a mistake that was pushed along by a higher power that wasn't meant to happen like he was supposed to achieve enlightenment and then simply become a guide and i think that's what the hypothetical future was for him which he saw through those eyes like the one where we get to see the baby buddha to the young buddha to the adolescent buddha to the grown man buddha to the sage buddha to the death buddha i feel like that was the path he was initially supposed to walk down if he didn't achieve some sort of enlightenment but by getting enlightenment, it allowed him to sort of transcend his human limitations. And I like that. It's a very interesting story that gets told. And we get to see Buddha steal his brother's casket to give him true happiness by allowing him to flow down the river. And then we get to see Buddha just going around and doing whatever he wants. He's telling everyone to shut up and live the life that he wants them to live or he wants to live himself. It's a very happy tale of someone going on and finding themselves and doing what they want in order to find themselves it's just buddha traveling the world and the interesting thing is is that he seems to not be called buddha he's still called by his original name his human name and interestingly enough when he goes to save the girl before that he doesn't have the staff but then he does he has this interesting staff i'm not sure if we've seen it before i feel like i recognize the design but i'm not sure if it was in the previous chapters but then we finally get to see buddha back in the main line and he's ready to help zero go through his temper tantrum and finally achieve some form of enlightenment and i actually really like that because now after reading this chapter i can definitely tell that buddha isn't actively going for the kill he doesn't really care i uh, not know he cares but not in the way that he wants to kill and defeat zero but he cares in a way that he wants to defeat and save zero i can definitely see parallels being drawn between zero and Buddha's older brother. I can definitely see Buddha guiding Zero along throughout this fight. Like, 
slowly but surely allowing him to focus that misery into something else or simply change his fate, change his destiny. And I think that's very, very cool. I'm super excited to see where this goes because he is the one who decided to go against a fate decided by others, while Zero is the one who decided to write fate for others. And one way or another, one of these beings ended up happier than the other, and we can obviously tell which one that is. We're in a super interesting spot because now I'm just wondering where the fight's gonna go because we've gotten both of their main backstories out of the way. Sure, we don't know how Buddha encountered his weapon, which I feel like would be a cool story to tell, especially since it seems to have some form of sentience on its own. It seems to be sort of independent of him, and we know there isn't necessarily much of Zero's backstory to be seen because Zero split away too quickly. He split up. So I wouldn't be shocked if we got a second part of Buddha's backstory and maybe a quick glance at Zero's backstory when he was the Seven Sins and it was just him going through the world and like he has his true misery, despair self locked away or like egging them on to do things. So that may be the only other backstory parts we get, but now I feel like we're actually going to get into a main like fight fight because so far this has just been Buddha styling on Zero. And while that's cool enough, I do like Buddha styling on Zero. I do actually want some legitimate combat between the two. That is still one of my favorite parts of Record of Ragnarok. So I would love to see some actual fisticuffs or weapon of cuffs between the two because it would just be interesting to see at this point. Especially now that we know Buddha's main motivation or we can guess Buddha's main motivation isn't really to defeat Zero, more so reform him. And we can know that Zero's motivation is still the same. He still wants to kill Buddha, but I can, I can definitely understand where Buddha's going with this rather than before I'm like Buddha if you don't hurry up and finish this man off I swear bro you're still styling on him just eliminate him get us to run seven right now now I'm simply here like okay 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 we're rocking with it we're rocking with it. I see you Buddha I see you Buddha all right let's get it and that's the thing now I'm excited because y'all know I was kind of clowning on zero for the past couple chapters I I found zero's backstory was played a bit too comedically for my taste especially for how serious of a subject matter it was on and I also found like the previous chapter just like Buddha styling on zero for about 40 pages or something like that. However long the last chapter was. Hold on. 49 pages. There we go. So that was basically all of last chapter. But now that the fight, at least in my mind, has changed end goals. Now it's just going to make me wonder, is Buddha actually going to kill zero? I feel like Buddha isn't going to be overwhelmed by zero at any point in this fight. But now my question is, how far is buddha willing to go to defy the gods in order to save humanity if he's even trying to save humanity at this point because now that it's revealed that he doesn't really care about anything outside of what he himself wants is humanity his real goal or do he just want a good fight i think he is still aligned with humanity but the main rule of this tournament is that you have to kill your opponent and i'm assuming buddha wouldn't want to kill someone he sees as the mirror well darker mirror image of his brother so I'm intrigued to see how Buddha's going to take this and if he's just going to defeat Zero and how that's going to affect the next matches if Buddha refuses to kill Zero. And I hope Zero doesn't end himself because he just hates it all and wants it to go. I actually really want to see what Buddha's going to do. I want to see what Zero's going to do because now both are in a very interesting predicament because Buddha doesn't actually want to defeat Zero. He Well, no, he wants to defeat Zero and make him see reason and help him instead of just letting zero die or something like that because he probably sees his brother in zero however on the same token zero still hates buddha he wants him dead but of course he's very unlikely to get him dead so i'm interested to see how these two are going to react the longer the fight goes on and the more and more one party realizes that they are unable to do anything to their other party because the other party can see directly into the future and has a weapon that adapts to every situation essentially so i'm super intrigued with where we're going to go i really love buddha's backstory i think it's very interesting i think it's beautifully drawn i wish we could see more of these characters like buddha's older brother the king i really like him i like the king's design like buddha's father's design i love the design of all the different just the world like i'll admit as a person who struggles with drawing backgrounds myself, I'm always impressed when I see very beautiful backgrounds. And the mangaka does a fantastic job of doing that. And I love how the mangaka, like, there's a difference between, like, flashing back to panels and just reusing them. So I love how the different panels in Buddha's life all sort of fill up the circle that leads to his enlightenment. Like, this is a very visually stimulating chapter. And I think that's very good. And it's very impressive considering how long this chapter is. I know they get a whole month to work on it. But even still, just the insane amount of visual detail that goes into the chapter, from the shading to the character designs to the variations in the character designs, all the symbols on the different clothing, there's very little, there's nothing in this that I can say is lazy. It's very beautiful, refined. It's 
it's weird to say it's artwork but y'all know what i mean when i say it's artwork it's like you can put almost any of these panels up in a museum and you could just marvel at them it's wonderful especially that panel where buddha points to the sky I love, like, you can see the author went out of their way to draw the individual grains on Buddha's nail. Like, the detail's insane. I love this manga for the detail. Ja, golly, I just can't imagine drawing this, even if I had a whole month's time. The ability to draw 60 pages of this just beautiful work is amazing to me. Honestly, solid 10 out of 10 chapter, at least for me, just because I love seeing Buddha's backstory, I love learning more about his weapon, this was super interesting to see, Zero didn't have much time to complain in this chapter, so I have no reason to get mad at him, honestly, this was just a great chapter, full of interesting characters, full of a great backstory, full of more information that's super interesting to learn about, and honestly, it gets me interested for any hypothetical future stuff, like, Maybe Buddha meeting the person who put him on this path, the person who chose his destiny for him. I'm super intrigued to see what this is going to do and what Buddha is going to do with that information if he ever finds out about it. There's so much stuff, but that's enough of me. What do you guys think? Please tell me in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And hit that little notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is That Guy with a Pencil, writing off.